Welcome to worship this morning. Let's stand and sing the first two songs, please. Jesus is all the world to me, my life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day. Without him I would fall. When I am sad, to him I go. No other one can cheer me so. When I am sad, he makes me glad. He's my friend. Jesus is all the world to be, my friend in trial sore. I go to him for blessings, and he gives them more and more. He sends the sunshine and the rain. He sends the harvest golden grain. Sunshine and rain, harvest of grain. He's my friend. Jesus is all the world to me. I want no better friend. I trust him now. I trust him when life's fleeting day shall end. Beautiful life with such a friend. Beautiful life that has no end. Eternal life. Eternal no joy, he's my friend. Will your anchor hold in the storms of life when the clouds unfold their wings of strife? When the strong tides lift and the cable strain, will your anchor drift or firm remain? We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Fastened to the rock which cannot move, Grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. It is safely moored till the storm withstand. Fortress well secured by the Savior's hand. And the cables pass from his heart to mine can defy the blast of your strength divine. We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Fastened to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. When our eyes behold through the gathering night the city of gold, our harbor bright, we shall anchor fast by the heavenly shore with the storms all past forevermore. We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Fastened to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. Be seated, please. In moments like these, I sing out a song. I sing out a love song to Jesus. In moments like these, I lift up my voice. I lift up my voice to the Lord. Singing, I love you, Lord. Singing, I love you, Lord. 
singing, I love you, Lord, I love you. In moments like these, I sing out a song, I sing out a love song to Jesus. In moments like these, I lift up my hands, I lift up my hands to the Lord. Singing, I love you, Lord. Singing, I love you, Lord. Singing, I love you, Lord, I love you. Good morning. It is so good to see everybody and your smiling faces. No smile bigger than Mr. Ron this morning. Uh, for those of you that Kiwa College basketball, you understand what I mean. A um, few quick announcements this morning. Uh, same as they have been for the last couple of weeks now. Uh, Soul Food Cafe is this Thursday. Uh, we've got a lot of great uh, help coming for that. I'm very, very appreciative of that. Uh, if you are helping with that this Thursday... Um, please try to be at the refuge out at the O'Brien County Fairgrounds um, or Union City Fairgrounds. I don't know exactly what it's called, but uh, out at the fairgrounds. Y'all know what that means. Um, somewhere between uh, 5, 5.15, we start serving at 5.30 um, to help get everything kind of set up for that if you can. Um, I'm also in need of two or three. Uh, if you can be there early, just let me know. And when I say early, I mean somewhere between the hours of like 3 and 4. Uh, to help prep some of the food. If you can't, I understand, but if you are able to be there a little bit early to help us kind of cook some of the stuff that we've got coming, uh, just let me know this afternoon. Uh, I only need probably three or four to help do that. Um, so that is this Thursday. Please keep that in mind. April 17th is our sunrise service. Um, that is going to be at 730. Uh, I know several of you have been wondering what time the sunrise service is actually going to be. Sunrise that day is actually at 620. We're being nice. Uh, so 730, we'll be here at the building. Uh, I'm pretty sure we're planning to do that inside as well. Um, so for those who take a big sigh of relief, you don't have to bring your blankets and lawn chairs. It's okay. Uh, so 730 that Sunday morning, that'll be uh, immediately followed by a brunch in our activities building. And then an Easter egg hunt. Uh, if you'd like to help with the Easter egg hunt, I know Rachel Clark would love volunteers to help her with that. If you have any questions or you'd like to make donations, see her. Um, we're accepting donations for candy, eggs, uh, and all of that. Just get with her on details about that. Um, and then there are still sign-up sheets out in the foyer for what to bring for that morning. Uh, and then also there is a sign-up sheet in the foyer. April the 21st, Antonio Andolce is going to be here for a supper uh, that Thursday evening. That's at 6.30, correct? Greg, 6.30 for that. Uh, he will be here that evening. Uh, there is a sign-up sheet in the foyer. Please, please, please uh, make it a priority to be there for that and be sure to sign up on the sheet so we know how much food to have. Thank you. I have the prayer this morning. Before I speak, I just want to say... Um, Antonio Dose is coming in the 21st, so if you can, please sign up for that. Even if you if you just think you're going to come, let me know on that because I'm trying to line up a meal for that, and so I need to try to get that done because I'm going to get that catered. But I just want to you know have an idea what what we've got coming for that night. And I know it's Thursday night, but just let me know on that. Also, I hope you're liking what's going on in here. We're making progress. Um, um, got some more things to do, but like I said, the carpet's going to be a little bit, but uh, hopefully it's going like. Everybody likes, and I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for all the help, that's for sure. Let's go to him and find prayer. Our Father, thank you. Thank you so much for this beautiful, beautiful day you've given us, and, and we're so thankful for the time of the year when the spring is here and we see the flowers blooming and the trees blooming and life is seem like coming back and, and reviving. And, dear Father, we're so thankful for that and for the seasons. Father, we're thankful for this place that we have here that, uh, that you've given us to come together as a family of yours to worship you and lift you up and uh, to give you praises, and uh, we're thankful for that. I know sometimes we take the little things of life and the simple things of life for, 
we just take them for granted, dear Father, and I pray that you'll always know that our heart is so thankful for all that you do for us. Father, we're also mindful that uh, uh, there's many maybe in our midst here that are going through struggles uh, with sicknesses and illnesses and, and other challenges of life, dear Father. But I pray and hope that we each all realize that we can come together as a family of yours and come to you and bring that to you, but we can also come together and help each other walk through our challenges and as, of life that comes upon us each and every day. And I pray that we have open eyes and open hearts to help each other, and not only in this community here, but throughout the world and other places that uh, need our uh, prayers and need our help. And I pray at this time, dear Father, that you'll continue to be with the people in Ukraine and going through the turmoil of what's going on there and the loss of life and the destruction of everything there. And I pray that... Uh, calmer minds and wiser minds will take over and that you'll somehow step in and stop this and uh, just uh, pray for those people and I pray that when opportunity comes that we can help that we open our arms and hearts to them and and uh, help out any way we can father we pray today that you'll uh, go with us as we go through this worship service that we can lift you up and and give you all the praise that's due and that we can understand the love that you have for us and dear Father, I pray that you'll be with uh, Nathan as he brings a, a lesson with us, and we're so thankful for him and, and, and the lessons he brings to challenge us each and every week to uh, strive to be closer to you. And I pray that through this year that we can be the church, that we can be who we're supposed to be, that we can be the people that serve and look and love on each other. And I pray this week, Father, as we have the Soul Food Cafe, that we're going to work there, that we come with... Uh, joyful hearts and open arms and that we love on people and serve people and show that we do have a love for mankind and that any way that we can help that we help and stretch out our arms and love on the people that come there bless the workers that are going to come and, and help and just thankful for each and every one of them father we know we fall short we know we make mistakes and we ask forgiveness for those things but dear father we know that you sent your son to die up on a cross so that we can have hope that even though we do sin, we do have an avenue that we can ask forgiveness. And I pray that we use that in the prayer. We come to you always declaring our faults, our mistakes, and asking forgiveness and asking you to lead us in a better way. Father, we ask that continued guidance today. May this be a great and glorious day for you, dear Father. For it's in your Son's precious name we do pray. Amen. As we contemplate the Lord's Supper, we'll sing Lamb of God. Your only Son, no sin to hide, but you have sent Him from your side to walk upon this guilty sod and to become the Lamb of God. O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. O wash me in His precious blood, my Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Your gift of love they crucified, they laughed and scorned him as he died. The humble king they named a fraud and sacrificed the Lamb of God. O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. Oh, wash me in his precious blood, my Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. I was so lost, I should have died, but you have brought me to your side to be the light, your staff and rod and to become a Lamb of God. 
O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. O wash me in his precious blood, my Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. In Revelations chapter 20, beginning in verse 11, John writes, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. In verse 12, I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. I heard a devotional this week on this passage, and it was kind of the whole idea of the two sets of books, that there's one that just contains one book, the Lamb's Book of Life, and then there's the group that's many books, because it's the books of the lives of everyone who has lived. And then in that devotional, it kind of made an analogy that I wanted to use this morning. You know, it, if you could imagine it, if you had a book, just say a book. And on the cover of that book, it said, The Life of Jesus Christ. And maybe a little subtitle, Words, Deeds, and Actions. And then in that book, you were going to find a perfect life. Someone who was righteous, who never had an evil thought or wrong deed who never did sin, perfection. And then if you can imagine another book, and on that cover it had the life of, and you can put your name. For me it would be the life of Kevin Dobbins. Words, deeds, and actions. Well, within that book you would find some good things, some good words, some good deeds, some good actions. But along in that book you're also going to find Every single bad or impure thought that I ever had, every bad or wrong sinful word I ever said, every sinful deed I'd ever done, private, public, whatever, it'd be in that book. And what God has done, he's taken that cover off my book. And he's placed it on this other book. So now on the cover it says, The Life of Kevin Dobbins, Words, Deeds, and Actions. And when the judge opens that book, he's going to see that perfect life of Jesus Christ. No deceit, no sinfulness, no evil thoughts, nothing. And because of that, God will credit, the verdict will be, He will credit the righteousness that that life deserves to the one who's on that cover, me. I'll be credited the righteousness, the salvation, the eternal presence of being with the Lord because that's what that life deserves. And then you say, well, what does that really have to do with the Lord's Supper? Well, because that's only half of the exchange. You see, by doing that, God has also taken the cover that was on that book that said the life of Jesus, and He's placed that cover on my book. And now the book says the life of Jesus, words, deeds, and actions. And when that book is opened, there's going to lie those impure thoughts, 
those evil desires, those private sins, every sin that I ever committed. And being the just God that He is, there will be a verdict. And see, some 2,000 years ago, that verdict was handed out. And it was handed out to now the cover that's on that book, Jesus. See, that's the greatest exchange that's ever happened. In fact, Paul sums it up pretty clearly. He said in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21, that God made Him, Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us. So that exchange is so that in Him, we might become the righteousness of God. And that's what we remember this morning, is the exchange that took place. Jesus went to the cross to pay the penalty for my sins and for yours. So at this time, let's honor Him as we take this meal together. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for your son Jesus and his willingness to go to the cross, not for anything that he ever did or has done, but for what we've done. The sins that we've committed throughout all humanity, that your son was willing to take that punishment that we so deserve upon himself. Dear Father, we're going to take a moment now to take of an emblem that will remind us of the body of your son Jesus that hung on that cross. And just help our thoughts to be focused on you and your son and that sacrifice and to realize that it should have been us that received that and not him. Just help us to take this in a way that brings honor and glory to your Son. And it's through him we pray. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we take of an emblem now that reminds us of the blood that you shed on the cross. And it's the blood that you shed that reminds us that our sins can be taken away because of your pure blood. And Jesus, your perfect life has made this possible. And again, we thank you for that exchange you made for us on the cross. And it's through him we pray. Amen.
Let's pray again. Dear Father, we just reflected on what you've given us through your Son, Jesus. Something that we can never earn on our own. Dear Father, I just pray that uh, now you'll bless us in this opportunity to give back to you in the best that we can. Not only through our money, but through through our lives, dear Father. And I just pray that we'll live a life that brings honor and glory to you. And thank you again for the gift of your son, Jesus. And it's through him we pray. Amen. God is so good, God is so good, God is so good, He's so good to me, He cares for me, He cares for me. He cares for me, He's so good to me. I love Him so, I love Him so, I love Him so, He's so good to me. He answers prayer, He answers prayer, He answers prayer, He's so good to me. Children's Church is dismissed as we stand and sing Heaven Came Down. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day, day I will never forget. After the wandered in darkness away, Jesus my Savior I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend, he met the need of my heart. Shadows dispelling with joy, I am telling, he made all the darkness depart. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole. My sins were washed away, and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down, and glory filled my soul. Born of a spirit with life from above, into God's family divine. Justified fully through Calvary's love, oh, what a standing is mine. And the transaction so quickly was made, when as a sinner I came, took of the offer of grace he did proffer, he saved me, oh, praise his dear name. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Now of a hope that will surely endure after the passing of time. I have a future in heaven for sure, there in those mansions sublime. And it's because of that wonderful day when at the cross I believed 
Rich is eternal, and blessings supernal from his precious hand I received. Heaven came down, and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away, and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down, and glory filled my soul. Be seated. Psalms 145, verses 1 through 7. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and His greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another, and you shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor, splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. Good morning. <clears throat> it is a great day to worship our God. Amen. Amen. I do hope you mean it when you say that. Uh, I don't say that just because it's something that uh, gives you guys a cue to put reindeer antlers on. Um, I, I say that because I mean it, and I hope you mean it as well. It is always a fantastic day and opportunity when we get to come together and worship our God together, especially one that is as beautiful as it is today. Uh, in a few moments, we're going to sing an invitation song. That invitation song is used as a time for you to make your needs known. Uh, if you are struggling this morning and you would like prayers, we would love to be able to do that for you. If you've never put on Christ in baptism and you want to start uh, your life today, leave happier this morning than you've ever been in your entire life, we would love to do that for you as well. Uh, we'll do that in a few minutes after the end of this sermon. You all thought I was going to offer it right now and just be done, and that's not how it works. Uh, we do that as a, as a time of convenience, and it is that. It's a convenient time for us to do that. It's a time that we've set aside, but the truly great part about that particular invitation is that it is open all the time. Uh, it is never, ever a bad time to reach out to a brother or sister in Christ and ask for prayers and to lay something on somebody and say, hey, I need your help and encouragement. Uh, it is never, ever, ever a bad time to put on Christ in baptism. And that is one of the things that makes God so incredibly good. Uh, it never fails that inevitably as a preacher, sometimes you hit a sermon writing block, okay? I'm not saying that's what happened this week, but it just happens. Sometimes sermons, uh, you, you, there's no such thing as an original sermon, by the way, let's just throw that out there. But sometimes in your effort to make things fresh and original, you sometimes can hit a writing block. If you've written in your life, you understand what I'm talking about. And so occasionally preachers will ask, hey, what should I preach on? They'll reach out to friends family, maybe members of the congregation, they'll say, what should I preach on uh, over the next couple of weeks? And inevitably, somebody with a fantastic sense of humor goes, God, you just preach on God. You should preach on the Bible. You should preach on Jesus. And so a lot of times, preachers will look at that and go, okay, I get it. But sometimes you've got a preacher that also has a sense of humor and they go, okay, we're going to talk about God. Because after all, if being the church is what we're striving to be, part of being the church is following God. God. And it's important to look at God, not only in His message from time to time, but also in some of His characteristics. And so that's what I want to do this morning. The iPad will cooperate with me. We were talking about this morning, Dr. Hill. Sometimes technology just doesn't want to cooperate. But that's what we're going to talk about this morning. We're going to talk about the goodness of God. There is a movie series. I don't know if you're familiar with it or not. If you're not, you probably should be. Uh, I think it's. I, let me put this in a phrase. I think it's good in some instances. If you're talking about objectionably good movies, I wouldn't put them in that category because the acting is just kind of okay. But the storylines are fun. This series is called God's 
not dead. I think there's three of them at this point. There may be a couple more. I'm not sure. But God's Not Dead is three movies, and there are some pieces that are intertwined with one another, but it really addresses three very specific, very distinct issues across those three movies. And they're all really interesting. They're all incredibly uplifting. Uh, But there is one particular theme that kind of reoccurs, or a phrase, I should say, throughout every single one of these. And it is the phrase that God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. And that's an incredibly true statement, whether we realize it or not. And it's from that statement that we're actually going to look at this morning. The idea of the goodness of God. Now, before anybody starts getting really nervous, I want to make very clear, I'm not about to go through Genesis to Revelation and talk about every single reason that God is good. Okay, I could probably do a series from now to the end of the year if we were to do that. We're not going to do that either. Okay, But I did want this morning to take a few moments and look at a few of the reasons why God is so good. And I want to put a, an asterisk on this particular, uh, a beginning of this particular sermon because I understand this is not in any way, form, or fashion trying to undermine or slight somebody who may be going through a very difficult time, right? Because oftentimes, in the worst moments of our life, it's really difficult for us to see the goodness of God. And a lot of times, at those most difficult moments, people with the best intentions will say something that that not is necessarily true, but will want to point us to God, and that's the last thing we want to hear, right? Anybody ever been going through a really, really, really difficult time in your life, and somebody came to you and said, well, everything happens for a reason. God is just giving this to you because He wants you to get better, and that may be true. It may not be true. Sometimes things just happen, but oftentimes we don't really want to hear that. We just want somebody to look at us and hug us and go, it's going to be okay eventually. It hurts And that's going to be fine. But we do need to understand that even through the roughest parts of our life, oftentimes more so in the roughest parts of our life, we can understand why God is so good. So we're going to look at that for just a few moments this morning. The first answer or the first reason that God is so good is because He answers prayer. If you've been paying attention to me at all in the last almost year I've been here, you had to know that this was coming, right? God is good because He answers prayer. God is good because not only does He answer prayer, but the fact that He gives us an avenue to come before Him and speak to Him through, through Jesus, right? To be as vulnerable as we want with Him should be an example of His goodness. He wants us to do that. I used to talk about this with teenagers all the time, why the importance of prayer was such a big thing. And I would relate this to dating somebody, right? And it's kind of weird when you talk about dating and God. I get that. But if you were going to have a relationship with somebody, and you wanted that relationship to be intimate, to be vulnerable, to be more than surface level, and you decided that you were going to have this relationship, and you said, I'm going to have this relationship, but I'm not going to talk to this person except for maybe once a week. You're not going to have the kind of relationship that you want to have, and you're definitely not going to have the kind of relationship that's going to be overly beneficial. God wants you to have that deep relationship with Him, and He gives you the opportunity anytime you want to be vulnerable and to go to Him in prayer. John 15 and verse 7 says, If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. Mark eleven twenty four says, Therefore I tell you, everything you ask for, believe that you have received and it will be yours. Psalm 120 and verse 1 says, In my distress I called to the Lord and He answered me. And Psalm 138 verse 3 says, On the day I called, you answered me, you increased strength in me. God wants to answer your prayers. He wants you to come to Him in prayer And it's such a great blessing to have that ability to be able to petition God for anything. Now, the Bible does clarify that our prayers have to meet a certain standard, right? We have to be able to pray with faith. We have to be able to pray with boldness. We have to be able to pray with an earnest and righteous heart. But if we do this, we can be confident, not only that God will answer us, and now don't get me wrong, the Bible also clarifies that God can answer us in ways that we don't want Him to answer us, okay? Uh, I'll never forget, I had a Bible class teacher growing up. His name was Jason Scarborough. He used to pray. He had, one, he had a child, his firstborn child uh, was a handful, so I've been told. Uh, I grew up with him. I didn't get it, but I was probably a handful too. So uh, he was praying to God night after night after night, God, just give me patience. I just need pa-. Some of y'all are ahead of me right now. Y'all know where this is going, right? He said, God, I just need patience. And he prayed, he said, for about six months every night, he prayed for patience. One day his wife comes in and says, honey, I'm pregnant. And they go to the doctor and it's twins. 
He said, that was God's sense of humor, granting me patience, because those twins were twice the handful that, that his oldest son was. So God will answer sometimes in ways that we don't expect, sometimes in ways that we don't want, but we can be confident that when we pray to God, He listens. That in and of itself is such a blessing that I think sometimes we forget. We feel like we've got this avenue of prayer and we want God to answer those prayers, but something has to happen in between, right? God listens to us. Anybody in here ever been having a conversation? Those with teenagers understand this all too well. Anybody in here ever had a conversation with somebody and you realize about halfway through the conversation they're just completely zoned out? They're thinking about something else. Braden, your mom is shaking her head hard right now. They just zone out, and you know, it's one of those things. By the way, if you've ever preached a sermon, that happens about halfway through, too. I just want everybody to know that. Uh, you get this idea that you get halfway through, and you realize they're not paying attention to you, so you have to stop and go, what did I just say? Right? We don't have that problem when it comes to our prayer life with God. We are confident that God listens to to us. 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. This is the confidence that we have before Him. If we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know He hears whatever we ask, we know that we have whatever we have asked of Him. It's such an important aspect, again, that I think sometimes we do that. And I ask this question, why is that such a big deal? Well, it's because God never had to give us the avenue of prayer. God doesn't have to to listen to us. God can give us exactly what we need because He knows what we need without us ever asking for it, but He wants it, and He does this not because He has to, but because He is so good that He will listen to our prayers, that He will answer our prayers in the way that we need Him to answer our prayers, even if we don't understand it. I like to say that God answers prayers in a number of ways. The most popular ways are yes, no, and not right now. And we don't necessarily like that third one, but God knows more so than we do. And it's because He's so good that we have this avenue, that we have the ability to hear Him. I just read this verse. I forgot to put it up. I apologize for that. But this idea that the confidence that we have in Him is that He listens to our prayers. The second reason that we can be confident in God's goodness is because He comforts us. Anybody in here ever had to memorize the 23rd Psalm when they were growing up in Bible class? I did. I had to memorize that thing in order to graduate, which was really kind of funny, right? We had to graduate Bible classes. Like, you can be held back in Bible school. I always thought that was kind of ironic. Uh, But in order to get either from first grade to second grade or second grade to third grade, we had to memorize the 23rd Psalm. And one of the most popular parts of the 23rd Psalm is when David writes, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You see, our God is a God of comfort. Our God is a God of one who in our darkest times we can rely on Him and lean on Him and know that He's there and wants to comfort us. And He'll comfort us in a number of very different ways if we'll let Him. John 14, 26 says, But the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything that I have told you. And God's Spirit is with us to comfort us. We are comforted in the words that He left for us. Romans chapter 15 and verse 4 says, For whatever is written in the past was written for our instruction, so we may have hope through endurance and through the comfort from the Scriptures. God can comfort us just by being God and by us using or reassuring ourselves of the fact that He's not going to leave us. God's not going to forsake us. He might be distant from us at some times, not of His own doing, but because we have decided to put sin in between ourselves and God. But He is going to be there to comfort us. Music has always been a big part of my life. If if you've known me very well, you know that I love music. Music is, I've been singing since I was a a very little kid. I did competitive choir in high school because I was a nerd that way. It's okay. Uh, But I love, 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 love music. And there's a newer hymn that we tend to sing. And when I say newer, I mean like 2013. So like I don't like using the terms newer and older, but sometimes that's all anybody ever knows. In 2013, there was a a song that was released that really got a powerful message. It was called, Whom Shall I Fear? And it says a lot of really encouraging things, a lot of really comforting things, if you think about it from the perspective of God. It says, You hear me when I call, you are my morning song, though darkness fills the night, it cannot hide the light. It says, whom shall I fear? 
Speaking of God, it says, You crush the enemy underneath my feet. You are my sword and shield, though troubles linger still. My strength is in your name, for you alone can save. You deliver me. Yours is the victory. Whom shall I fear? It says, And nothing formed against me shall stand. You hold the whole world in your hands. I'm holding on to your promises. You are faithful. That chorus refrain says, I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. Whom shall I fear? That God, that all-powerful, all-incredible God who can accomplish anything he desires, that is my God. That is your God. And he never leaves your side. That's incredible. What do you think of it? That should be comforting. That should be encouraging. The idea that a God who controls armies of angels is there for you, wants to be there next to you. A God whose name is above all others wants to comfort you. 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 and 4, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. For He comforts us in our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are any other kind of affliction though the comfort we ourselves receive is from God. That's a really important point there, too, that God comforts us so that we can understand that comfort and comfort others who are also going through things that maybe we understand, maybe we don't understand, but can point them to God because the comfort that we find is from Him. And that's so incredible. And you got to ask, why does He comfort us? Why does He care enough to comfort us? He doesn't have to. He does it because He is so good. Thirdly this morning, we know that God is good. We understand His goodness because of the love that He has for us. That God loves us, which is such a powerful statement. We overuse that word a lot, love, right? We use that term in ways, and there's different degrees of it, right? Like, I love good steak, right? I don't love good steak in the same way that I love my wife or love my parents. But we overuse that term a lot. Teenagers use that term a lot, have no idea what it means. It's okay. Uh, But we do. I did when I was a teenager. Uh, Teenagers do now. Sometimes adults use it, and we don't understand what it means either. But God loves us in such a deep and such an unconditional and such a powerful way. I'm going to start with the obvious one here, right? John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that He sent His only Son. Whoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. Anybody ever heard a sermon where that preacher told you that instead of the world, just put your name in there? Right? I'm not going to do that, but you can. Uh, to put your name in that blank that God so loved, and it makes it so much more personal, but it's true. It's the whole reason we do that, because we want you to think about it on a personal level. God loved you so much. First John chapter 4, and verse 16, We have come to know and to believe that the love God has for us That God is love and the one who remains in love remains in God. It's such an integral part of who He is. Romans 8, 37, Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says, But God proves His own love for us and that we were still sinners. Christ died for us. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, But God who is rich in mercy because of what? His great love for us that He made us alive in Christ even though we were dead in our trespasses. There's more and more and more examples that we could point to. We'll get to a couple of them. But God is love. And I don't want to paint an unbalanced picture here. right? That's a lot of times we see people that like to paint this unbalanced picture. God is a God. The Bible makes it very clear of vengeance, of jealousy. He is a God of perfect judgment and wrath. All, by the way, go into making God good. By the way, you can't have a good God if you don't have those attributes as well as the love of God. But I also want us to point out the most prevalent thing, characteristic that is used in all the Bible to describe God is that of His love. Because He is love. He loves us. He cares for us. All about God's goodness is wrapped up in His love. And the truly unfortunate part about that is, is we as humans, whether we realize it or not, we actually try to take that love away from God. Part of that is, is because it's hard for us to fathom exactly the kind of love that God has for us. But we try to take it away from Him. We say, God, if you'd love me, you would just do this one thing for me. Right? That sounds like teenage love, doesn't it? That sounds like spouses fighting with each other love. If you loved me, you would do this. If you loved me, you would never ask me to do that. 
And we do the same thing with God. We say, God, if you love me, you wouldn't make me sacrifice this part of my life. God, if you love me, you would fulfill this one request that I have for you. If you love me, why would you let this thing happen to me? And oftentimes we do that because something in our life is so tragic and we want to try to make it make sense But the idea that sometimes it just won't make sense isn't good enough for us. The Bible tells us that God's thoughts are higher than ours and His ways are higher than our ways, and yet we still feel the need to say that, God, if you truly love me, you wouldn't give me whatever it is I was having to handle in this one moment. Because that's not what a loving God would do. You see, what happens is we try to put our humanized version of love on God's unconditional love, and it doesn't click. It doesn't make sense, and so we try to take God's love away from us. We try to take the love that He has for us away from by mistaking there's a correlation between pleasing Him and the love that He'll show us, right? Which is so unfortunate that we see this idea that God only loves me if I live this perfect life dedicated to Him, which actually can be incredibly discouraging because you and I understand that we can't live a perfect life. So if God is only going to love me if I'm living a perfect life, then God can't love me. That's not what the Bible teaches at all. We make this mistake of saying that God loves me more than He loves somebody else because I'm living in a way that's better than so-and-so, whether it's down the street or somebody across the room from us. I'm living better than them. I don't struggle with the things that they struggle with. So God has to love me more than that person. That's not true. Just because you may please God more than somebody else does not mean that God's love is reserved for you and you alone. Or we get really caught up in... Let Satan creep into the back of their minds and say, God, there's no way you could love me who's done X, Y, Z. Fill in the blank. All these horrible, terrible things that I've struggled with in my entire life, there's no way God could love me because I've been doing those things since I was a kid. I don't know if I can give them up, and I'm trying my absolute best to live in a way that, that is living in the light as He is in the light, but I'm struggling. There's no way that God could ever love me if I'm still struggling with these things that nobody else around me is struggling with. There's no way God could forgive me enough or love me enough to forgive me for all the things that I've done in my past, despite the fact that the Bible says there's more rejoicing for one lost soul who repents than somebody who never needed repentance in the first place. Because of God's love for us. God's love is unconditional and it's so great and He loves you just as much as He loves everybody else and He loves us despite of everything that we put Him through. Despite the fact that we question Him, despite the fact that we allow our faith in Him to waver, despite the fact that we deny Him in front of others because we might be afraid of being judged or we might be afraid of being in an awkward situation, we deprioritize Him because it makes our life easier and so we'll fit God into our schedule as long as it's convenient. We refuse to serve Him because we don't want to be uncomfortable and it requires sacrifice on our part. We lie, we gossip. We will hurt each other in the church for no reason. We fight. We don't acknowledge Him when we need Him. We will only acknowledge Him if things get too bad. We sin. We crucified Him. And after all of that, He still responds by saying, I love you. That's incredible. Because everything about that goes so counter to what our human minds want us to think. If somebody did all of those things to us, we would struggle so much with the idea of talking to them, with the idea of forgiving them, with the, the idea of loving that person is so far from our mind. And yet everything that we do to God, that we continue to do to God, God responds by saying, I love God you. Not with a shallow teenage love or a hallmark Christmas love, but with a perfect, never-ending love that it's so difficult for us to fathom. 1 John chapter 4 verses 9 and 10 says, God's love was revealed among us in this way, that God sent His one and only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. Love consists in this, that we loved Not that we loved God, excuse me, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. That kind of love. Why did He do that? Why did He do that when He didn't have to? 
I'd argue that it's because God is so good. God never had to create us in His image. God never had to care about what would happen to us after the fall in the garden. God never had to be the God that He is to us today, but He does so because He is so good. Because He answers prayers, because He comforts us, because He loves us, because He wants to do all of those things. The challenge for you this morning, that's First John 4. I'm slacking on the clicker. First John 4, 9 and 10, as we just read. The challenge for you this morning which some of y'all thought I was done with that, and now you're all disappointed that you got another challenge. They're still here. The challenge for you for this month is I want you to focus on the good in your life. And again, that can be really difficult at times, can't it? When everything seems to be going out of whack, when stress seems to be overwhelming, when we lose a loved one or we have a falling out with a friend or things are just hard, it can be hard to look at the good in our lives. So I want us to focus on that good. You take something that might seemingly be not good and turn it into something good. For example, somebody cut you off in traffic this week. Don't focus on the guy that cut you off. Focus on the 99 out of 100 other people that are driving on the correct side of the road. Right? You don't have to worry about somebody coming straight at you most of the time. If you go to lunch this day and they mess up your order and you don't get the food that you're looking for, how about we focus on the fact that We had the means to be able to go and eat this afternoon. I want us to focus on the goodness of God. When the week gets stressful, when your teenager back talks to you, when your toddler refuses to listen, focus on the goodness of God. Because even though this life is hard, even though this life is stressful, even though this life will dish out some things that may seem overwhelming, you and I are striving for something so much better than this life. We are following a risen Savior. We are following a God who loves us, who comforts us, who answers our prayers because He is so good. And the truly sad part about all of that is that despite those very real facts, there are still going to be those that reject Him, that choose to reject Him. There are going to be some that never commit their life to Christ, that never put Him on in baptism. There are going to be some that will walk away from friends and from family, that will wander away from the church and have no intention of ever coming back because the church hurt them and they're going to find their love and their comfort in something else. There are going to be those that never, ever embrace the sacrifice of a Christian life because it's just easier to do what they want to do And the sad part is, is they will never get to enjoy the reward that is waiting for us, for those of us that that dedicate our lives to Him, that want to live and show others the goodness of God. This morning, if you have any kind of need, it's very simple. We want to help you, we want to pray for you, we want to encourage you, we want to love you. More than that, God wants to love you. If you have a need, won't you come as we stand and as we sing? People need the Lord. People need the Lord. At the end of broken dreams, He's the open door. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. When will we realize that people need the Lord? People need the Lord. People need the Lord. At the end of broken dreams, He's the open door. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. When will we realize that people need the Lord? Bow with me, please. Our Father, we thank you for this beautiful sunshine today. We thank you for the privilege and opportunity we've had to come together this morning to worship you.
Father, there are some that I want to pray for this morning before we leave. I'd like to ask a special blessing upon Larry Farley as he suffered another heart attack this week. Father, just be with him. And also Steve and Beth Muse, as well as their granddaughter, Royce and Brenda Aker, Shirley Dobbins, Nita Gucci's mother-in-law. And Father, we ask a special blessing upon the Moran family as Bryce lost his grandmother this past week. Just be with him and comfort him as only you can. And Father, as Nathan said this morning, we can always remember that God is good no matter what happens. Go with us now so as we depart and go our separate ways. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.